Okay, I'm just doing a follow up on the uh, David Bohm and Basil J. Hiley article about um, Jack Sarfati having a confused analysis that quotes them out of context. And the article explains how when the quantum potential is goes to the infinity then it repels the particles the electrons in the double slit experiment and that's what causes the wave pattern of um, single electrons going through the double slit experiment and um, so that you, that the word repel is what is the anti-gravity, uh, what is gravitationally repulsive. Now the, um, the weak measurements being studied now in terms of the Bohmian physics are able to then um, do these sub-quantum um, changes in the momentum and essentially the momentum is directly proportional to the frequency and so what the Bohmian model is showing is that you have a the, the standard Schrodinger equation as a wave function actually contains a real and um, imaginary component um, in the in the complex um, number so you have imaginary time and essentially the 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 quantum potential then is a um, negative frequency as inverse as a inverse to the time from the future and that's what the weak measurements are showing is that the gravitationally repulsive quantum potential as a novel force is due to this non-commutative time frequency and the um the focus of the article by Hiley and Bohm is that <clears throat> this quantum potential in the when you have a many particle system it demonstrates that the quantum potential is is always changing as a whole as a non-local interaction and therefore it cannot be measured externally um, from the perspective of the particle it has to be a um, constant non-local dynamic or process um, before the particle exists in this sub-quantum dynamic and so that's the foundation that is inherently non-commutative and And it does not require a wave function because it's a non-commutative quantum algebra as Basel J. Hiley demonstrates. And so before you have any zero point in space-time, you already have this time frequency dynamic that's non-commutative and non-local. And it's inherent to any um, manifestation of a particle so each particle in space-time already has two points in this deeper non-commutative dynamic that actually the points exist as frequency and time so they're they exist as a algebraic um process and you could call it like uh this is what roger penrose calls proto consciousness and so there's no um need for any human observer or any other kind of observer based on the speed of light so normally in physics the you cannot have the speed of light as a rest frame but what this is demonstrating as Basil J. Hiley, um 
has corresponded to me in email is that he does not think there is a rest frame, a symmetric rest frame in physics. And this is also true in, um, in, uh, the, this was also the, the view of, um, Louis de Broglie, uh, that, um, it, um, John G. Williamson, he gave a recent talk as a, uh, in response to Martin Vandermark's, uh, presentation on, um, the photon being, not having a center, a symmetric center of mass. So when you apply the law of phase harmony based on time and frequency to the photon, then you get the, the rel the relativity from the momentum shows the same, um, non-locality. Uh, as the source of the photon um, that doesn't have a center center of mass, so it's it's inherently non-commutative also, and it doesn't have a symmetric rest frame. And the reason this is important is because in quantum biology we can use we're we're using biophotons directly when we meditate when we turn we close our eyes and we turn the biophotons around because in um, quantum biology it's been shown that the eyes are emitting biophotons and so then um, by meditating we're reversing that process we're using the photon directly as so that you know as, as what would normally be a, a rest frame but since the photon doesn't have a rest frame then it it, in, it inherently resonates with this non-commutative non-locality that is a repulsive force it's gravitationally repulsive and it repels matter but it also um since it's the cause of the gravitational repulsion is this um non-commutative algebra that Alain Kahn just calls two, three, and infinity um, based on music theory. So he's saying that music theory is the simplest way of um, explaining the non-commutativity. And in fact, it's non-Western non music theory. It's Pythagorean music theory. So it's discrete number that overlaps in the future and the present. And so this is the origin of the one half spin also being inherently non-local. And, um, I quote, um, Larry Domash, Domash, who was a Hampshire college quantum physicist who, um, realized that the, the secret of the mantra training in, um, Eastern meditation is that you are by silencing you're in, you're inhibiting the left brain dominance in the prefrontal cortex uh based on internal language or sound and therefore you're able to create the space that allows the frequency that's non-commutative to then resonate from the quantum potential the non-local quantum potential um, as a quantum tunneling uh, between the neurons. And so Larry Domesh was a physicist for the Transcendental Meditation uh, Movement. Um, and he realized that this created a kind of um, uh, AC Josephson effect from the Brian Josephson's. Brian Josephson also was part of the Transcendental movement, but now he practices Qigong. He practices Qigong at Cambridge. And so, um, this is what he told me, Brian, Nobel physicist Josephson in our correspondence. So essentially, um, then Eddie Oceans was at Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, and he realized the secret of quantum psychology is based on this same 
inhibition of the prefrontal cortex using um, non-commutativity as a macro quantum coherence of what he called self-referential motion uh, with the essentially it's the Dirac the Dirac dance as a um, 720 degree spin um, which is the the physical manifestation of the particle from the one half spin but since it's originates from the one half spin there's never and it's due to the non-commutativity you can maintain that non-commutative um, motion into the into the macro scale as a like an, an eternal um, har harmonization what you know what Louis de Broglie called the law of phase harmony so you constantly have the future guiding um, matter in the past um, and then so, as I was so what I was trying to get to earlier is that the so this information is also able to create new matter um, essentially it's since all matter is actually made of light made of photons and so in the Bohmian model originally the photon was no longer a particle but rather an, an energy um, activation um, of this of the quantum potential and the so you know you can people can debate well you know what is the photon but essentially because of this secret of the photon not having a center of mass and the momentum being directly proportional to the frequency as what you're doing is instead of defining the reality from the particle you're defining the reality from the source of the of the light and it's inherently non-local it's so the in the in this article by Bohm and Hiley they're saying well the the non-locality thus far has been demonstrated in certain experimental um, situation setups but the non-commutativity shows that this non-locality is inherent to the source of reality and this is the point of Alain Khan this is the focus of Alain Khan is he gave a 2015 talk to um, physicists and he's been <laughs> he's been making the same emphasis in his most recent talks also that the on, on the origin of prime numbers that the what is seemingly random is not actually random and in quantum physics it's it's technically called indeterminate and not random um, and so the it's not actually indeterminate but it's also not determinate either it's a um, a precognitive um, guidance or har harmony from the future that um, is discrete but it's more dense than the geometric continuum of symmetric space-time um, and so as Alain Kahn points out all of physics thus far has been based on commutative geometry that assumes an, inver an invariance of symmetric space-time and so that's why non-commutativity is ignored or um, as Alain Kahn says it's considered a nuisance or strange and and Roger Penrose he said this in his um, YouTube talks that he considers non-commutativity to be a nuisance and that he's not very good at it even though you know he's a mathematical physicist and um, has a Nobel Prize and he taught um, Stephen Hawking and and so the Penrose he emphasizes that the origin of the universe is asymmetric highly asymmetric time and that's what non-commutativity is it's asymmetric but it's also coherent 
And Penrose points out that this is due to the gravitational potential originating that what he says is dark energy, he says is actually the gravitational potential um, originating from this quantum potential as negative entropy from the non-commutativity of time and frequency. And so then um, you end up with what he calls fundamental time, which is a phrase he got from Lee Smallin, and Lee Smallin was the, had his first quantum physics teacher as the same teacher that I had, Her Herbert J. Bernstein at uh, Hampshire College. And so um, the, as Penrose points out, the gravitational uh, entropy is the opposite of the entropy of matter. And so the irony is that all of our technology as applied physics thus far has been an attempt to decrease the entropy of matter with technology, but using commutative geometry. So for example, um, the reason the the North won the Civil War against the Confederacy using slave labor was that the North relied on standardized um, off-the-shelf technology that could be replicated you know, using standardized units of measurement. And of course, that's those standardized units of measurement rely on commutative geometry. And another example, I just read a great article um, from about uh, Clifford Algebra. And it points out how, you know, like Steinmetz was the one who developed the mathematics to explain alternating current used by Tesla, invented by Tesla, and the the motors, you know, invented by Tesla, the generators. And, and so the, the alternating current also relies on this, you know, potential. But the, the AC uh, Josephson effect is used if you look at the National Institute of Standards and Technology they define the the volt the definition of the volt actually relies on the Josephson effect to define it and so you have this superconductor um, that has zero resistance and then the volt arises from that but if you listen to Josephson's um, Nobel prize lecture, he explains that you cannot have the Josephson effect without a spontaneous um, breaking of space-time, or uh, this breaking of the space-time symmetry. So normally, um, you, you're you assuming that you have an invariant space-time symmetry that's then defined by matter but what non-commutativity has shown is is showing is that the that there is no inherent space-time symmetry, but rather the origin of the universe is from an asymmetric uh, time that um, Lou Kaufman, math professor Lou Kaufman, calls primordial time, and um, Alain Kahn calls it primitive time. And this is what uh, Roger Penrose calls fundamental time. And so um, Lee Smallin, in a in some a recent interview he did, he's he's asked you know about asymmetry, saying that at a fundamental level, physics is actually asymmetric; that the origin of reality is asymmetric, in contrast to this quest for extending symmetry into um, higher dimensions in the based on the standard model and so the non-commutativity model is what um, Basil J. Halley says it's a radical um, restructuring of physics and the 
the non-Western um, meditation training has always been based on what physics calls non-commutativity. I was calling it complementary opposites for my um, music theory philosophy that I did my master's thesis on. And even then, I was still not uh, crystallized in the concept, what it meant mathematically. And so I came across a paper that claimed the Tai Chi, the Tai Chi symbol of yin and, <clears throat> yin and yang was a modeled by a logistic equation. And of course, if you have a logistic equation uh, based on logarithms, well, that's, that's commutative geometry. <clears throat> And so it wasn't until a physicist who studied music theory, he offered to publish my master's thesis, but then he told me he couldn't understand it. And so then I read his book on, this is uh, Charles Madden, and he had a book on fractals in music. And then he points out that the Tai Chi symbol is not a fractal because it's not symmetric. It's asymmetric. And that's what that's when I realized that I had made that error in my master's thesis by trying to claim that the Tai Chi was a based on this logistic equation, but it's actually, you know, what I had been calling complementary opposites. So I was still making this error of conflating the symmetry with the asymmetry and um of course, um, you know, Basil J. Haile, he point and David Bohm, they point out, well, the particle does, it does, it's from the, the quantum potential having a value of zero, so the, you have a, it's basically like the limit of the quantum potential, then you get matter arising from that, but um, it doesn't have to be. So from the perspective of the matter being made of, of photons, then you can have this violation of the conservation of momentum that, and this is being shown in the experiments of uh, Sir John Pendry. He's relying on negative frequency directly proportional to momentum. And he's saying that they violate the conservation of, of momentum by um, transforming uh, virtual photons as negative frequency into real photons. And the standard model is still trying to claim that virtual photons are just a mathematical trick of renormalization. But what um, Basil J. Hiley has demonstrated in detail is that Richard Feynman was incorrect to claim re renormalization because he was ignoring the the quantum potential in the in the Schrodinger equation. So when you split the complex number into the real and imaginary parts, then you end up with this um, quantum quantum potential um, that is gravitationally repulsive. And therefore, um, the, the, you have to take it as a, since it's a potential, you have to take it as the um, Planck's constant uh, squared or h, h bar squared. And so the, it's only the, um, both Dirac and Feynman were ignoring the, the uh, second order of the, um, of the, uh, as acceleration of, for the, um, the, uh, Planck's constant. And you can think of Planck's constant as just the average energy of light. So this was the, um, focus of Julianne, Julianna Mortensen, uh, Brooks. And there's other people who have pointed this out that when you look at the units of measurement of Planck's constant, what he did was when he convert when Planck converted um, frequency 
or the energy into joules as a density for the particle as a photon. He um, he canceled out the time in order to get the frequency. So he's assuming when he's using, he's converting the seconds. And when he converts the seconds, then he is able to cancel out the times. But the problem with seconds is the concept of seconds assumes a symmetric spatial measurement of time. And so, but when he canceled out time to just get the frequency, then he lost, he lost that, um, resonance from the non, non-local, non-commutative time. And again, this is called um, the uh, two, three, and infinity by Alain Kahn. So it's like the simplest equation possible. But what it shows is this, this is what I get into in my music theory analysis. And I recently got a, an email, actually yesterday, from Professor Hiley saying that he loved my music article that he, I sent him. I don't know which article, or maybe I didn't send it to him. Maybe he just found it. So thank you to Professor Hiley for that compliment. And I'm going to leave it at that.